to win. Brother and I get lined up with brother. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Today, Carl Sandburg, poet, historian, novelist. The minstrel voice of America, the teller of stories, and the singer of songs. Recorded on his 79th birthday. I've been home early and late. New York to the Golden Gate. And it looks like I'm never going to see my wandering. There is a human stir throughout our American song with the heights and depths to be found in Shakespeare. The rich and the poor, robbers, murderers, hangmen, fathers and wild boys, mothers with the soft words for their babies, workmen on railroad, steamboat ships, wanderers and lovers at home. They tell what life has been for them. Like every day when I'm at all in hell, that's a good thing. I gotta go find the guitar and pluck a little at it and go over old songs and new songs, and as long as I live, I'm gonna be learning songs. Going from the world of fire and beneath this western sky, we formed a new dominion, a land of liberty. The world is telling we're free and we, and as such shall ever be. Huzzah, 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 for a free, free America. Lift up your hands, ye heroes, and swear with proud as it may. The wreck that would ensnare ye shall allay the snares in vain. Should you repent ye all her force? We will meet her in this parade and fight and shout and fight for brave, brave America. The call to hardship, toil, and combat runs like a blood scarlet thread woven through the story of our people. It has caused to build this nation. Willing men and women in struggle and risk, in self-denial and pain, in familiarity with sacrifice, wounds and death. Those living men of the past paid that cost. And uh, all the record of American youth in the last war. Ooh. Better Korea War, uh, but more particularly the World War. There are epics of valor and endurance and imagination out of our era that has it so on so colossal a scale that uh, very hard to get it. It has even now, I think, in proportion to the population, as many heroes now as there ever were. A long, long while I made it to December And the day goes on When you reach September And I lost one day And I walk a little lane And I have not time And the days turn to gold, and the day grew soon. September, November, and the days golden days I spend with you.
course I've been asked lots of times. What do you mean out of life, Carl? What do you want most of all? The kind of cold. Well, I've been thinking about it, of course. All my life I've been thinking about what I want out of life. And, uh, I guess I could say, mainly, mainly five things. To be out of jail, first of all, to be out of jail. This is a free country. Something pretty nice about being out of jail. Second, to eat regular. Why not? And third, to get what I like, printed. And fourth, we'll say, a little nice affection hither and yon over the American landscape. And then, maybe, maybe the fifth, maybe the fifth thing that I need. It seems like every day when I'm at all in health, I've got to sing. And the deep golden day, I spend with you. to have that I had in the 60s. Most. At 60, I could still run 50 yards at a fair speed. And I could run up most any stairs. Now I walk very slowly up the stairs. Not that I got any heart condition, but there are compensations. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, wrote about old age. I don't like the phrase. Frank Lloyd Wright and I are agreed that we have done some of our best work in our 70s, and uh, he has done some of his best work in his 80s. I like the privilege of calling myself old if I like, but uh, I don't like to be called old man. Because for one thing, for one thing, I have a much younger heart for the things that the young love and enjoy over the world than most of the poets now setting forth their obscure antic lines. A whole lot of it is uh, anti-democracy. The big general run of it. Uh, they'd be ashamed to write a poem for... Uh, what what they term the herd, the common people, politics, no, anything that might lead men to act. What they want is involved places, high intellectual windings. They are latitudinous and sepulchral. <laughs> The most, the most they may never had no fun. Just plain fun. When I was a boy, only, uh, even in the small towns now, there's sidewalks, there's the concrete, sidewalks, and there's the streets that, that are concrete. Uh, very few kids nowadays that have known the luxury of running bears with just and in mud. And, uh, going to a corner and playing with a gang of kids to half past eight or nine o'clock and then going home and, and uh, putting your feet under a pump. <laughs> <laughs> a luxury. No, <laughs> The, the more I feel sorry for those who have a few millions and got to have money and uh, never learn what Pascal meant in saying that the miseries of men come from not being able to sit alone in a quiet room. They've got to have radio now, they've got to have TV. 
The books were enough for Pascal. You listen to the World Series. And unless you step out and turn the darn sound off, you think that we're just millions of men running, running around wondering how they get a shave. Ha, 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 ha. Five extra blades. <laughs> Cigarettes will spoil your life, ruin your health, and kill your baby. Poor little innocent child. Just a mild. All cigarettes are milder than all other cigarettes. Except the wonder of the age. I have often thought of the difficulties of running an apparatus that has its cultural phases. Where in a radio station, a TV station, reaching millions of people a day, and in the goal, 18, 20 hours a day, 52 weeks a year, 365 days. Just endless that pressure on them. What to feed the listening public? And there are some operators of stations who are indifferent. And then there are those who understand responsibility. Freedom to print whatever you want. Freedom to put human utterance out on the air for millions of people to hear. That means responsibility, too. I was no to review of the uh, Chicago Daily News for seven years. I wrote over a thousand motion picture reviews. And the number of classics among what they have produced out there, the number of classics is very low. Maybe a hundred... Certainly not more than 200. They don't take themselves seriously. The game of playing with the public. Most of them try to strike at the subconscious, the blood rather than the brain, the primitive. Violence, sex, because those are in most of the great dramas and novels of all time. But the stress on them out there is a little too. Velvet Preston. Love me tenderly. Don't be cruel. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, leave Lincoln come. Out of the wilderness. Out of the wilderness. Out of the wilderness. Oh, leave Lincoln come. Out of the wilderness. Something like a million and a half words. 
The book. To follow. Always the Young Strangers. That book about the first 20 years of my life. Maybe. Everything in the just chance. How they bloom. Here and yon. In that book now, I'll be square. I'm going to meet a gal. Oh, that's good. There's midnight black hair. Still a few bronze hairs. Yes, bronze. Yes, it's not her youth. And, uh, I think she's smarter than I am. <laughs> she was five days a captive. She's going to work this to Run rings around me in tennis to their mathematics. Well, I tie up with her in the last 48 years. <laughs> <laughs> when I was writing pretty cool poetry, she told me to go on. <laughs> <laughs> Because we have looked over all the other systems. 
found uh, that they too have waste, corruption, demagoguery, and other evils. And we take our chances on the democratic system because of what it has that the other systems don't have. And in no other system can a man be so many different kinds of a fool and get away with it. And get paid for it. So long as he isn't interfering with other fools, he always has the alibi. This is a free country, ain't it? Personal freedom, a wide range of individual expression, a complete respect for the human mind and the human personality. This is the ideal of the democratic system. In all the literature, the documents of democracy, you can find this respect, this hope, this attitude of reverence towards the fullest possible flowering of each human personality. President Lincoln enjoyed quoting the Irishman who said, In this country, every man is as good as the next one, and for the matter of that, a little better. Carl Sandburg at 79. Historian, novelist, American minstrel, seeker of the American dream, and poet. His favorite poem, it's a whole book called The People, Yes. And here are some lines. The people will live on. The learning and blundering people will live on. They will be tricked and sold and again sold and go back to the American earth for loopholes. The people are secure and renew and come back. You can't laugh off the capacity that has it. Brother may yet line up with brothers. There are men who can't be bought. There are women beyond purchase. The fire born of a home in fire. The stars make no noise. You can hinder the wind from blowing. Time is a great teacher. Who can live without hope? In the darkness, with a great bundle of grief, the people mark. In the night and overhead, a shovel of stars for peace. The peace of March. Where to? What next? Where to? What next? You've been listening to the CBS Radio Workshop and Carl Sandberg, American Minstrel, recorded for Mr. Sandberg's 79th birthday by Joseph Wershba. Edited in association with Tom Perkins and produced in New York by Paul Roberts. <laughs> Acknowledgements are made to Mr. Gregory Delessio and to Harcourt Brace and Company, publishers of Mr. Sandberg's work. <laughs> this is Dan McDonald inviting you to listen again each week at this time to the CBS Radio Workshop. Love, 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 to the CBS Radio Network. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, the theater of the mind, dedicated to man's imagination. And today, on her birthday, dedicated to one of the show business greats of all times, Miss Sophie Tucker.
starring in No Time for Heartaches, written and directed by Sam Pierce, with Margaret Whiting playing Sophie as a girl. I don't suppose it's ever happened to you, Miss Tucker, but, well, I can't figure it out. What's that, honey? Well, I mean, well, I'm young, and, and people have told me I'm pretty, or at least I'm kind of pretty. <laughs> and I've been singing ever since I was about five or six years old. But every time I get... You sit in your room at the Beverly Hills Hotel listening to the girl. You listen and you look. And she is young. She is pretty. And you find it hard to concentrate on her story because it takes you back 10, 20, 30, 40, 53 years to Sophie Abuser. It's a long way back. A long way back, Sophie, from this plush room in the Svelte Beverly Hills Hotel. But the girl's voice pushes you back and you wonder how it happened. How you got from there to here. You remember that first time you left your home in Hartford, Connecticut, with a hundred dollars in your pocket and a note to several of the top Tin Pan Alley songwriters from your friend, Willie Howard. You were young then, Sophie, and you knew you had it. You had it in you to be big in show business. But you were scared, too. And you had to take a deep breath before you knocked on the door, Mark Harry Von Tilson. It took two or three knocks to get an answer, but then it came. Yeah, come in. Mr. Von Tilzer, I'm a friend of Mr. Willie Howard's. Oh, and... fine, good. Oh, that Willie Howard, he kills me every time I see him work. He told me I should talk to you about a song. Song? What song? Wait till the sun shines, Nellie, Bird in a Gilded Cage. Both of those are good songs. I wrote them. Well, those are wonderful songs, Mr. Von Tilzer, but well, I meant I was to talk to you about singing a song. Oh, well, I sing very badly. About me singing a song. About you singing? <laughs> well, how do you like that? You're a singer. What are you saying? Well, I don't have any songs of my own, but I've sung some of yours in my mama's restaurant in Hartford, and Mr. Howard thought maybe if you heard me sing, you could help me get a job here in New York. Well, if Willie says you're good, who knows? I see. Now, what would be good for you? Uh... I know the one that people always like in Hartford uh, on a Sunday afternoon. Oh, fine song. Yeah, I liked it the minute I wrote it. Uh, how do you do it? Well, sort of... la da da dee 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 Hey, good. Fine. Come on, let's try. On a Sunday afternoon In the merry month of June Take a trip up the Hudson or down the bay. Take a trolley. No, no, I don't know about that song for you, honey. That, that isn't quite right. Well, I wasn't singing it the way I did. No, I know the one. You try this one. Mm-hmm. Now, here, the, the words are here in the sheet music. I'm going to fall to leave you. Well, you know when I go that I was the fella with the do do no, do No, 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 that's not it. Yeah. Well, I, I used to sing Wait Till the Sun Shines, Nellie. Uh, that's one of yours, Mr. Von Tilden. Yeah, but I don't think that's right for you either, honey. I'm, I tell you what, I'm kind of busy right now. I'll get my new songs into shape for a show. And after I get through with them, oh, in about uh, six months or so, you come on back and we'll see what we can find for you, huh? I really can't understand, Miss Tucker, is the way the studios always think they know what's best for you. I mean, well, like last week, I got a call from Paramount, and they had a part they wanted me to test for. And the minute I saw it, I knew it wasn't right for me. It was a kind of a stupid girl, not even pretty or anything, and she had to wear frumpy clothes, and I just couldn't do it, Miss Tucker. I wasn't right for the part. <laughs> Not right for the part. Not right for the part. Does that ring a bell? A kind of a sour bell at that. And yet, a bell that rang out the start for a lot of wonderful things for you, Sophie. You've been working at the German village, singing from 50 to 100 songs a night for a salary of $15 a week. And you know that you've got it. You know the folks like you. You also know you can't make big time singing a hundred songs a night for fifteen dollars a week. Then some of the boys at the music publishing houses tell you about the amateur nights at the 125th Street Theater. And the next amateur night you're lined up with fifty other girls 
and waited your turn to see the head man, Mr. Chris Brown. All right, girls, don't be in a hurry. Listen, we got all the time in the world. We'll get to every one of you before the night's over. Now, you, what's your name? What a folly. What do you do? Oh, I act. I do imitations of people and birds. All right, all right, Gladys. Let's hear something. Sure. This is an imitation of a bird. <laughs> That's a bird? Oh, sure. This is an imitation of a donkey. <laughs> uh, all right, all right, Gladys. All right, thank you. Next. I'm next. I know. What do you do? I sing. My name is Sophie Tucker. I've got some songs here with me. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, try these three. Hey, Charlie, take these and play them for this girl here, will you? All right, Mr. Brown. Here they are, Mr. Charlie. Now, I do this first one sort of free on the verse, and then I hit it on the verse. <laughs> You sang the three songs for Mr. Chris Brown, and he said you could work the amateur tonight, and you knew this was the really big break. All the producers and booking agents would be there, listening and looking, and your hopes go up like a kid's balloon. And then, when you're walking out of the theater, you hear Chris Brown's voice, and he's talking to his assistant, and you can't help hearing what he's saying or knowing he's saying it about you. All right, Eddie. Uh, and look, that last one, the big one, she's so big and ugly, the crowd out front will razz her. So you better get some cork and black her up. <laughs> She'll kill him. So Eddie got the burnt cork and blacked you up. And you went out on a strange stage with the smell of cork in your nose and the sting of Chris Brown's words in your heart. And you sang everything you knew how to sing. And they liked you. You're a hit. And you started an act that took many years to get away from. Sophie Tucker in blackface. But your blackface act did lead you to the second Ziegfeld Folly. You won't forget that one, will you, Sophie? You stopped the show. You held up the $40,000 closing production number for 40 minutes while they kept calling you back to sing another song. And when you walked off the stage a hit, you hear the star of the show in the manager's office and you learn something new, something you didn't know before. I will not have her on the show with me. I'm the star of the show and a singer. One singer's enough. I want her out of the show and that's final. Yes, you learn, Sophie, you've got to be good. But you've got to choose your time and place to be good in. Miss Tucker? Uh, Miss Tucker? Oh, I, I'm sorry, but I guess you weren't listening to what I was saying. <laughs> Forgive me, honey. I was listening. I was just sort of thinking of something else at the same time. Well, actually, I didn't mean to take up so much of your time when I came over today, but... Well, there's so much I don't understand about show business. And you were in it for so long. <laughs> I'm still in it, child. Very much so. Oh, oh, I didn't mean it that way, Miss Tucker. But we'll take this business of an agent always telling you what to do. I don't see why that's right. I'll bet you didn't always have some old agent telling you what you could or couldn't do. I mean, well, like yesterday, he told me that I was wrong about not to... You look at the girl... She's sincere. She really means it. And you wonder how you can tell her what a good agent and friend can mean to any performer. And you remember the man who meant so much to your career, William Morris Sr., the boss. He gave you your first booking in Chicago at the American Music Hall. And you promised yourself to make the people like you. You went on number four out of 20 acts. And they wouldn't let you off. Virginia, I'm as lonesome as the lonesome pine. Say, I would give my soul. 
and later Jack Lake, the publicity man for the William Morris Circuit, spreads the word to the critics to come to the American Music Hall and hear the Merry Garden of Ragtime. And they came, didn't they, Sophie? Percy Hammond. Sophie Tucker's songs are not for parlor use, but they're certainly a success with the audience. Amy Leslie. Her songs are near to shocking, but Miss Tucker's fairness, her calm amiability, ready smile, and emphatic gestures carry her through, even without a bump. And Ashton Stevens in the Chicago Herald American... That was a piece, wasn't it, Sophie? And speaking of elephants and ladies, there's Sophie Tucker. If life were as large as Sophie Tucker, there would be room for all of us. I don't mind saying at once that Sophie Tucker is my headliner. Some of her songs are red, white, and blue, and some of them omit the red and white. But they are never quite dark navy blue. Rather, they are inclined to be evil only to the fellow who brings evil with him. If your heart is pure and your mind like the beautiful snow, you will have a lovely time while Miss Tucker is singing, but he only stays till Sunday. And I just couldn't make my feelings behave. Even less secular is the New York rag, Carrie, which becomes a syncopated Harry Carrie before Miss Tucker is finished with it. Miss Tucker can move an audience or a piano with equal address. Don't miss any of her. Yes, the critics came, and you learned one more thing about show business. It isn't always what they say, but the way they say it. They might laugh, and plenty of them did, but it's all right, as long as they're laughing with you. You know, Miss Tucker, my agent is always talking about what I should do. He even wants to tell me what kind of songs I should sing. Gosh, I know I have to sing things that people like, but I can't see where it makes such a difference. You can hear the girl talking, and yet you can almost see the earnest face of your wonderful friend and maid for so many years, Molly. The way she looked and sounded that day in Chicago in another hotel room. Molly had named you Patsy because she said you always be the one to take it on the chin, the Patsy. Patsy? I don't understand something about you. I don't understand lots of things about me, Molly. I ain't fooling. I mean it. Now, I've known you for a long time. Ever since the day I got tossed out of the Follies. Mm-hmm. And the only things I've ever tried to tell you were for your own good. Isn't that so, Patsy? Of course it is. Well, then, why is it that you won't listen to my friend's song? Your friend's song? What are you talking about? Patsy, I've been trying to get you to listen to me about my friend Sheldon Brooks for two weeks now. And I never get further than the opening line when you think of something that has to be done. Right now. This minute. Honey, I don't ever remember hearing the name Shelton Brooks. Well, that's because you haven't waited for me to get to it before now. All right. You have a friend who wrote a song and you want me to hear it. All right, Molly. Tell your friend I'll hear his song. You can tell him yourself, Patsy, because he's right outside the door. Come on in, Shell. Patsy, this is my friend Shelton Brooks. I guess you know Miss Tucker, Shell. Yeah, sure do. I caught your act at the theater, Miss Tucker, and it's really great. <laughs> guess you hear that from everybody, though. Listen, I may hear it from time to time, but don't ever let that stop you from saying it. It's the kind of music any performer likes. Now, uh, Molly tells me you've written a song. Well, I have one that Molly thinks you might like. It's uh, kind of a fast, bright song, Miss Tucker, but uh, you're good with fast songs. Go ahead. Play it once the way you like it. I'll join in with you as you go. All right. Wait a minute. Stop just a second. Let's try it a little slower. Some of these days you miss me, honey. Some of these days you'll be so lonely. You'll miss my hugging. You're gonna miss my kissing. You're gonna miss me, honey, when I'm far away. I feel so lonely for you only, cause you know. Yes, 
That's a day you'll never forget, isn't it, Sophie? The day you almost let the big one get away. You've sung it ever since. And you've sung it in almost every theater and club in the world. And it's still a great song. Some of these days. A song with the promise that you've had locked up inside of you all your life. A song that helped make that promise come true for you, Sophie. Yes, you were going great. Headlining at big time, vulnerable houses. Rolling up success from coast to coast. And then you open up a letter one day from William Morris. You call him the boss. He tells you he sold your act to Risen Webbers for a four-week contract. Risen Webbers, a restaurant. Which is just how you started so long ago. And it makes you mad. But the boss tells you it'll be the start of something new for you. So you open at Risen Webbers, and it starts a whole new era. After you've gone and left me crying, after you've gone, there's no denying. You feel blue, you feel sad. The list of names that played the room or came to have fun was a who's who of show business. Paul Whiteman, Abe Lyman, Guy Lombardo, Eddie Cantor, Al Jolson, Ruby Keeler, Ray Bolger, Ethel Berman, Ted Lewis. The list is endless. And as always, the boss was right. From the Sophie Tucker room at Risen Webber's restaurant, the idea spread and linked arms with the jazz era to become the nightclubs of the future. Miss Tucker... Miss Tucker, your doorbell's ringing. Uh, yeah, yes, of course. C- c- come in, come in. I have a message for you, Miss Tucker. Thank you, son, thanks. Thank you, Miss Tucker. Now, let me see. <laughs> oh, it's from my pianist, Ted Shapiro. You look at the familiar scrawled handwriting on the note, and you remember that time so very long ago, when your regular pianist, Al Sigler, told you he was leaving. You were opening a new act the following week, and you called your pal Ruby Cowan and asked him who could play for you. And Ruby said he knew a fella. And he sent him over to see you at the hotel. He walked into the room, a tall, thin kid in horn-rimmed glasses looking solemn as an owl. I'll never forget it. Miss Tucker, I'm Ted Shapiro. Yes, come on in. I was expecting you. Mr. Cowan said you were looking for a pianist and... I worked with Eva Tangway, and I played for Wellington and Cross. Uh, They're a dance team. Well, the main thing is to get the feel of working with me. I never do the song the same way twice, but I like to feel free and easy with what I'm doing. I see. Well, uh, shall I try one here? Sure. Let's try this one. You worked with Ted that day for several hours, and as rehearsals went, this one was pretty bad. Poor Ted couldn't transpose, and you couldn't sing the original keys, but you told him to work out the routines, and you'd use them next week at the Jefferson Theater. Remember how it went, Sophie? You played the bill, and when you closed after a big week, you were in a hurry because you were leaving for London next week. You were just leaving the theater when he stopped you. Excuse me, Miss Tucker, but I wondered... Well, I sort of wondered if you were satisfied with my piano playing. I'll let you know later. You know something, Sophie? He's been playing for you for 37 years, and you haven't told him yet. And you know something else? I'll bet he has a pretty good idea of your answer. 37 years is a long time to work with someone, and a lot of things can happen in those years. London, sleepless nights working with an English songwriter, changing the American words into English so the jokes would make sense. And finally, the Kit Kat Club and the warmest welcome you've ever had anywhere. It's a long ways from the Kit Kat Club in London to your first experience in Hollywood, Sophie. But you'll never forget it. You signed up to make a picture for Warner Brothers called Honky Tonk. And from the minute you read the first script to the day the finished picture folded, you had but one thought. This is a stinker. The only two things you got out of Honky Tonk 
with a $500 you bet Jack Warner it wouldn't play over two weeks in New York. And the letter you got from a fan in port a Algiers. My dear Miss Tucker, I saw your beautiful self in the cinema play, Honky Tonk, and I wish to tell you that I think you are the most beautiful lady I have ever seen. Your generous proportions appeal to me more than I can say. If you'll do me the honor to come to Algiers, I shall make you the favorite of my harem. I also have a pet monkey which I shall be honored to present to you, cordially, Sheikh Abel Ray. But you did come back years later, Sophie, and you made Broadway Melody at MGM with Eleanor Powell and Robert Taylor, and a young, vaudeville girl by the name of Judy Garland. And to you, it wasn't the greatest picture of the year, but it helped you to forget Hunky Tonk. And it taught you another lesson about show business, Sophie. Stay with what you know best, and you know vaudeville, and the club's better than anything. And you went back to the cabarets and the clubs, and you're playing them now. And when you look around and see all your friends at ringside tables wherever you play, you know you're in the right business, Sophie. You know it for sure. Well, I didn't mean to take up so much of your time, Miss Tucker. and I guess I've done an awful lot of talking, but I've always wanted to meet you, and, and I knew you could help me. Honey, honey, I don't know whether I can help you or not. I've been asked for advice from people who became stars before you were born. Mama Dolly used to ask me what was good for her kids, the Dolly sisters they became. Harry Richmond's mom brought him to me when he was wearing short pants. And many Marks and her boys, they became the four Marks brothers, and so many others. And I've told them the same thing I can tell you. Never be late. A headliner is always on time. Be sure you look right. You never know who you may meet. Never let down on a show and remember, when you're on stage, you're in character. Don't ad-lib. Don't be smart alecky. You may think you're being funny, but comedy doesn't come that easy. And be yourself. Don't be a carbon copy. And remember that first, last, and always, it's your work that counts. It isn't easy. And there's no time to be sick or to make any excuses. There's no time for heartaches. But if you make good in show business, it's something to be very proud of. It's well worth working for. And one thing more. One very important thing you must do. Take a look at yourself every day. You have heard the CBS Radio Workshop production of No Time for Heartaches, starring Miss Sophie Tucker, with Miss Margaret Whiting playing Sophie Tucker as a girl. No Time for Heartaches was written and directed in Hollywood by Sam Pierce and produced by William N. Robeson with music by Paul Barron. Featured in the cast tonight were Norma T. Nielsen, Hans Conried, Dawes Butler, June Foray, Jay Novello, Amanda Randolph, Roy Glenn, and Byron Kane. Tonight on Face the Nation, the head of the British Labor Party, Hugh Gateskill, faces a battery of top-flight Washington correspondents to answer many of the questions that are uppermost in your mind today. For the inside track on opinion inside governing circles, don't miss Face the Nation when it comes your way on most of these same stations tonight. Now stay tuned for Suspense, which follows immediately on most of these same stations. From Hollywood, the CBS Radio Workshop. Damage incalculable. 62 square miles of mountains and valleys of farms and pastures reduced to blackened ash. 85 homes burned to the ground. Four injured. One dead. Fire at Malibu. 
CBS Radio presents the CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Now, a story to challenge man's imagination, a story of disaster, and of man's capacity to meet and defeat it, a story of despair and hope. Fire at Malibu, starring Mr. William Conrad as narrator. The Eastern Pacific High. It stretched from Baja, California to Hawaii and north to Anchorage, Alaska. And back south again past Vancouver Island and Puget Sound, past the Farallons and the Channel Islands. Day after day, week after week, it squatted across half of the Eastern Pacific. For eight weeks, it remained immovable. You couldn't feel it or taste it. Or see it, excepting on the weatherman's map, but it was there. That vast, high-pressure area, blocking off the rain from the green forests of the northwest and the brown hills of Southern California. Weather moves from west to east, out of the bleak, black cold of Siberia and Mongolia, down across the Sea of Japan and on east across the Pacific. But now, stopped by the immovable high, the weather veered north across the icy mountains of Alaska, becoming a cold Arctic front, pouring down into the Great Basin between the Sierra Nevadas and the Rockies, and then spilling across the mountains to the west, becoming warmer and warmer by gravity and compression, until it roared down from the Mojave Desert into Southern California, a full-grown Santana, the wind of Satan, whipping up dust storms, clawing at palm fronds, whining through patios, and fouling swimming pools with the last of autumn's brown leaves. For eight weeks it blew through the chaparral, drying up the greasewood and the wild buckwheat on the rolling hills, desiccating the live oaks and the sycamores in the canyons. People's skins became dry and itchy. People coughed a lot, and their nostrils tickled as though they were coming down with a summer cold and they perspired freely as they went about their Christmas shopping in the unusual midsummer heat. By this time of year, there should have been a total rainfall of four and three-quarter inches. Less than a half inch had fallen since July. Christmas Day was beautiful under a blue, cloudless sky. The temperature was 77 degrees. Humidity, 13%. Western Airlines Flight 39 left Salt Lake City at midnight Christmas night, southbound for Las Vegas and Los Angeles. Because of the surface wind conditions, pilot Ben Laubacher brought her in high over the San Gabriel Mountains. He was cruising at 14,000 feet over Fontana at 2.40 a.m. when he made his first contact with the Los Angeles International Airport. L.A. Tower from Western 39. L.A. Tower from Western 39. This is L.A. Tower. Come in, Western 39. This is Western 39 reporting at 14,000 over Fontana, requesting landing instructions. Over. Hello, Western 39. You're clear to land on runway 25. Wind, northeast. Gusty. Thank you, L.A. Say, that's quite a fire you have down there. What fire? Well, there's a whole mountain burning up the coast ways. I guess somewhere back of Point Doom. I hadn't heard anything about it. Oh, well, take a look out the tower window. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it from here. Yeah, I'd better report that. Yeah, that you had, boy. Western 3-9, over and out. <laughs> Donna Cruz was fairly new at her job. She joined the Los Angeles County Fire Department as a switchboard operator and dispatcher on October 1st. Early in the morning of December 26th, she was the only operator on duty at the Malibu Fire Station of the Gura in the San Fernando Valley, some 45 miles west of Los Angeles. At 2.40 a.m., her switchboard lit up like the Christmas tree she had turned off before leaving for work a few hours ago. Fire Department, Malibu Station. I want to report a fire. Yes, sir. Where is it? Well, I don't know exactly, but from where I am, it seems to be up Zuma Canyon. Thank you, sir. Looks like the whole mountaintop's on fire. Yes, we'll take care of it. Excuse me, please. I have another call. 
Malibu Fire Station. Headquarters. We have a report from an airplane of a fire back of Point Doom. Yes, I already have it. Okay, Malibu. Battalion Chief Malibu George Reichert came in from the yes. kitchen with a pot of fresh coffee yes, to find you. Donna with more calls than she could handle. Malibu Fire Station. He slipped into the chair beside her and yes. took the next one. Malibu Fire Station, Chief Reichert. Uh, this is Soledad Canyon Station. We can see a fire over in your territory. Where in our territory? It appears to be about five miles west of Saddle Peak Lookout. Thank you, Soledad. We'll check. <laughs> From an airplane three miles above the earth, from a citizen on the ground, from a fire station 20 miles away, a rough sort of triangulation is possible. It is now 2.41 a.m. I'd put it in the general vicinity of Newton Canyon. That'll be engine companies 67, 70, 71, 72, and 88? That's right. Give them the long ring. The long ring. The warning bell. The alert signal that a dispatch is coming through. By the time the battalion chief has picked up the receiver, the men are awake, wriggling into their gear and scrambling toward their stations on the engine. Roll to a reported brush fire in the Newton Canyon area. And they roll. Engine 71 from the Zuma Station on Pacific Highway. Number 88 from the Malibu Beach Colony. Number 70 from Las Flores Canyon. 72 from Wachusa. And from across the mountains in Calabasas, number 67, ripping the stillness of the night after Christmas with the shrill terror of their sirens. The ranchers, the homeowners, the farmers come awake to the start as they hear them scream by, for they live with the fear of fire in these crisp and dusty hills. At 3.40 a.m., one hour after the fire was reported, 23 engine companies, three bulldozers, five work crews, and four patrol units. 170 men are fighting the fire. And the fire is winning. Crackling down the mountainsides, roaring through the canyons, whipped by a 50-mile-an-hour wind, forcing back men and machines, backwards and downwards toward the wide beaches and the sea, which surely must stop it. <laughs> There was no dawn along the beach the day after Christmas. The swirling black smoke merely became gray. And when the stinging hot wind whipped it thin from time to time, toward the east, a bloody ball hung momentarily at the mountain's rim, where men yesterday had seen the sun. Frank L. Dickover, Jr. had driven his wife and nine-month-old daughter to safety. And now he was returning to his home in Zuma Canyon to do what he could to save it. But he never got there. Smoke thicker than any beach fog engulfed his car, blinding him. After the fire had roared by, the highway patrol found the wreck. And nearby, Mr. Dickover's charred body. He'd broken his leg when the car went off the road. He didn't have a chance to escape. That first morning, County Fire Chief Keith Klinger set up his command post at the Zuma Fire Station on the Pacific Coast Highway. His command now comprised 430 men, including Navy and Marine personnel, moved in by truck from the CV base at Port Wanimi in Terminal Island. In the firehouse, where the gleaming engines usually stand, gray ladies of the Red Cross serve coffee and sandwiches to smoke-blackened firefighters. In the dormitory, men off the line were treated for eye burn and smoke poisoning. In the kitchen, Bob Singleton set up a press center to accommodate the reporters, radio commentators, and TV newsreelmen. Battalion 5B to First Assistant Chief. Battalion 5B to First Assistant Chief. This is Chief Percy. Go ahead. I think we've saved all the homes in the Zuma Canyon area, but the fire has jumped the highway at Broad Beach and taken two big houses. Chief Anderson to Zuma Station. Chief Anderson to Zuma Station. Go ahead, Harvey. Ramera Canyon is getting too hot to hold. Got to have ten patrols to work around the houses right away. Okay, Harvey. Did you hear that, Keith? Yeah. Ramirez goes, Escondido Canyon will be next. No doubt about it. Ask the sheriff's office to evacuate Escondido Canyon right away. Captain Sewell Griggers of the sheriff's aero squadron has a bullhorn on his helicopter. He uses it to untangle traffic jams on Los Angeles' far-flung freeways. This morning it is used for another purpose. 
as he flies low and slow up Escondido Canyon. This is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office. Escondido Canyon is in fire danger. Persons still in the canyon are ordered to evacuate immediately. This is the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Office. And First Assistant Fire Chief Roland W. Percy grimly sums up the situation. The fire spread very, very rapidly, and within uh, four hours, they had over 5,000 acres going. It's a very fast-moving fire. We cannot say how soon it will be under control. It's uh, burning uh, uh, fiercely on uh, all fronts right at the present time, and and the uh, weather conditions uh, are very unfavorable, and uh, reports we have will uh, last for the next two days. There are northeast winds, uh, and they're all uh, very drying winds. We've had this condition now for about two months, and, the, uh, and there is no moisture left in the brush whatsoever. It's very explosive. We have to be very careful where we place our engine companies and personnel so we do not trap anyone. Now the fire was shaping into a disaster. As they had in two wars, the mobile canteens of the Salvation Army moved up close to the fire line. At the Webster School on Malibu Canyon Road, the Red Cross set up an evacuation center. And as the refugees poured in on foot, by automobile, and some even on horseback, the stories poured out. There was Mrs. Jean Hasselquist's narrow escape. We just uh, woke up around 5 o'clock by telephone call from a lovely neighbor, and uh, we looked up at the whole uh, hillside, and the mountain range was on fire. And uh, we were quite sure that we weren't going to be in the flames until the last minute when it leaked over the far uh, hillside there. And all of a sudden, the, hill, the, the whole hill was just in mass of flames, and we just ran for our lives. We uh, just missed the flames by about 10 feet. By nightfall this first burning day, 900 men and 100 pieces of equipment were fighting a wholly uncontrolled fire. And 30 houses had burned to the ground, leaving nothing, ironically, but their stone chimneys and fireplaces. Among them was the beach house of TV star Ralph Edwards. We were fortunate that we weren't in the home at the time because our bedroom faces out on the ocean, so does the children's. And uh, it could very well be that the waves would be making such a noise that we wouldn't have heard the fire creeping up on us. Yes, we did have a lot of wonderful mementos in there, things that were very close to our hearts. But the ones I really feel sorry for are those people who lived on their land, who made their living out of the land, and to have their home go up in flames, that indeed was a tragedy. The second smoky dawn brings no relief as the fire roars on south toward Latigo Canyon. And here among the bright red fire engines is the blue and gray shortwave truck of radio station KNX and CBS News reporter Hugh McCoy. It looks as if we're trapped or at least temporarily stymied up here. Uh, The road has been blocked off by flames which just moments ago have leaped across the road up the side of the hill. Below here in the canyon, there is a house and a number of outbuildings which in just about a moment from now uh, will be... Uh, reached by those flames, and up here on the hill where the flames have jumped the road, another house, a green house, is threatened. I don't think we can make a stand here much longer. Jim Lowe, our engineer, is about ready to evacuate with the KNX mobile unit. We've got to make our way back down this road. The heat is getting more and more intense, and the flames are swept over more than a half a mile of these mountains now, raging, moving very, very fast. The house I told you about a few moments ago down below here is completely enveloped in smoke and flames. The people, we have just learned, have been evacuated from that home. And up here to my right, another house which is still standing is threatened by these flames reaching 20 to 50 feet up into the air as these wind gusts whip the black pall of smoke. Now that's all from Latigo Canyon. We've got to make our way out. The engines are evacuating now. That afternoon along Highway 101, the citizens of Santa Maria and Santa Barbara of Carpinteria and Oxnard knew something was up, something big, as a convoy of 18 civilian defense pumpers from Northern California roared south, red lights flashing, sirens screaming. Something indeed big was up as the engines from the north pulled into the Zuma fire station. 
Go ahead. We have a reported fire in the Hume track. Hume track? Yes, sir. Just north of the sheriff's substation on Pacific Highway. It's traveling very fast. It's already taken several homes. Thank you. Chief? Yes, Roland? Just got a report of a blaze above the sheriff's station. Well, that's eight miles east of here. It must be a completely new fire. It's got to be. Order out every available piece of equipment in both the city and county. I'll take these civilian defense engines down there myself. A new fire. Eight miles away, sweeping down the steep cliffside toward homes thickly clustered above the highway. Homes built high for the magnificent Pacific view. A view now obscured by ugly brown smoke choking out the setting sun. Bringing an early night to this California Riviera. An aborted night. Backlighted by the creeping, crackling, ruby-red line of fire. This is Todd Hunter reporting from the home of Horace Height at 22140 Pacific Coast Highway. Mr. Height at this very moment is up on the roof in his shorts with a hose wetting down his roof for directly across the street. These flames are roaring down the mountainside with a tremendous wind behind them and the firemen are on top of two apartments across the street wetting down the roofs and wetting down the surrounding area in hopes of saving the apartments. Sixty-two engines, twenty of them bumper to bumper along the highway, pour water up the cliff, while the others fight the fire house by house. And below, parked on the road, the householders in their cars, watching the smoke and fire blot out their homes, still gaily outlined in Christmas lights, and then pass on, leaving the homes and the lights intact as it roars on, insatiable to the west, toward the first fire, the Zuma fire, now contained but not controlled. And between the fires, the Malibu Beach Colony, the fabled playground of the movie stars, and back in the hills, the homes of simpler folk, and the Sarah Retreat of the Franciscan Fathers, where on that fiery night of December 27th, prayer performed a small miracle, as Father Robert Schmidt recalls it. It's the custom the Franciscan order to pray to St. Agatha for protection against fire. So we've been praying and... I think we had a sort of a miracle here last night because that when we uh, left at 11 o'clock, the, the tongues of flame were leaping over the lips of the hill. We thought the retreat house would certainly be in the path of it. But by some miracle, the wind changed. The planes started heading up the slope rather than down the slope. So we consider that a miracle that we ascribe to the, the prayers that we said in the last 48 hours. Father Schmidt was not alone in his prayers on this hopeless night. All over Southern California, the thoughts and sympathies of men of goodwill stretched toward the threatened people of the stricken area. And the thoughts and the sympathy and the prayers seemed not to have gone unheard. That night, the winds died down. The roaring red monster of flame flickered to a faltering standstill. By 10 o'clock Friday morning, as Governor Goodwin Knight asked President Eisenhower to declare a state of disaster in Southern California, Fire Chief Klinger could report. While I cannot say the fire is completely controlled, it no longer threatens property or life. At present, it is still out of control on the western perimeter and burning over the Ventura County line. But this is practically uninhabited territory. Thanks, Mine, Chief. Castro lookout on the line. Thanks, Roland. Chief Klinger speaking. I've got a new blaze, Chief. Oh. Approximately one and a half miles northeast of Lake Sherwood, sweeping southwest from Ventura Boulevard on a three-mile front. A third fire. By noon, it has swallowed nine homes on the shore of Lake Sherwood and pushed by a 35-mile wind roars on toward the Zuma fire on the other side of the range. Anything can happen now. If it joins up with the Zuma burn, we've got it licked. If the winds increase, who knows? Right now, we know one thing. It's out of control. The sun sank that Friday evening behind a dirty brown cloud of smoke that stretched 50 miles from the San Fernando Valley across the mountains and over the ocean to Catalina Island, sank red and angry, leaving behind its afterimage a corona of fire atop the hills. And 2,000 weary men, 
fought through that last long night. There was good news the next afternoon. Qualified in the cautious words of a weary fire chief. We now have the fire tied up in a slippery knot. The knot held. And so did the Pacific High. As the evacuees returned to their homes, bizarrely colorful islands in the black and gray landscape, they looked up at the hot, cloudless sky and hoped it would stay that way. Now there was no fear of fire, but of flood. When the rains came and come they must, what would happen to their homes with no living vegetation in the hills to hold back the waters? Day after day, forestry department planes flew over the 26,000 acres of devastated mountains and hillsides, scattering a half a million pounds of ryegrass seed. And the Pacific High held. And men ask, will the rains, when they come, come so heavily the seeds will wash away before they sprout? And men began filling sandbags and building dikes around their homes. And finally, the Pacific High weakened and broke. And the rains came. And once more, men prayed. It rained as it should have two months ago. It rained all day Friday, the 11th of January, all day Saturday, sometimes mercifully, sometimes fiercely, and no one could be sure. And then, Sunday's dawn burst into a blue sky, lazy with the fleecy clouds that follow a storm. Daddy! Da- Daddy, look! What is it, honey? Oh, look out the window, the hill. They're all green. Yes, like a green fuzz across the gray hillsides, the ryegrass had sprouted and pushed its way through the cold ashes like a promise of springtime. There would be food now for the hungry deer in the high hills. There would be tiny roots now holding back the soil against the next rain. And there would be beauty again in Malibu. Because man, who knows so well how to organize for his own destruction, had also learned how to organize for his own salvation. The CBS Radio Workshop has presented Fire at Malibu, Written, directed, and produced in Hollywood by William N. Robeson and dedicated to the thousands of firemen, deputy sheriffs, foresters, highway patrolmen, Red Cross and Salvation Army workers, soldiers, sailors, Marines, and honor prisoners who prevented a fire from becoming a holocaust. Fire at Malibu was narrated by William Conrad. The special musical score was composed and conducted by Lynn Murray, and the actors were Norma Jean Nielsen, Court Falkenberg, Larry Thor, Jim Nusser, Barney Phillips, Joe DeSantis, Lou Krugman, and Sam Pierce. Listen next week when the workshop comes to you from New York with the story of a man who lives for laughter, The Crazy Life, starring Henry Morgan. Crackerjack reporters fire the questions at leading government personalities every Sunday night on Face the Nation. For stimulating listening, hear the popular CBS public affairs feature, Face the Nation, tonight. You'll find it a rewarding excursion into the world of current affairs. Now stay tuned for Suspense, which follows immediately over most of these same stations.
on the guitar and pluck a little at it and uh, go over old songs and new songs, and as long as I live, I'm going to be learning songs. Born from the world of tyrants beneath this western sky, was born the new dominion, a land of liberty. The world is telling we're free and we, and as such shall ever be. Huzzah, 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 for free, free America. Lift up your hands, ye heroes, and swear with proud as it is. The wreck that would ensnare ye shall allay the snares in vain. Should you repent ye all her force, we will meet her in this parade. And fight, and shout, and fight, for brave, brave America. The call to hardship, toil, and combat runs like a blood scarlet thread woven through the story of our people. It has cost to build this nation. Willing men and women in struggle and risk, in self-denial and pain, in familiarity with sacrifice, and uh, these golden days I spend with you these precious days I will spend with you Because I've been asked lots of times what do you mean out of life? What do you want, most of all? The kind of cold. Well, I've been thinking about it, of course. All my life I've been thinking about what I want out of life. And, uh, I guess I could say, mainly, mainly five things. To be out of jail, first of all, to be out of jail. This is a free country. Something pretty nice about being out of jail. Second, to eat regular. Why not? And third, to get what I write printed. And fourth, we'll say, a little nice affection hither and yon over the American landscape. And then, maybe, maybe the fifth. Maybe the fifth thing that I need. It seems like every day when I'm at all in health, I've got to sing. And uh, these few golden days, I sing with you. These last days, I will sing with you. Where do I miss? Most, that's 80, but uh, I would still like to have that I had in the 60s. Most. At 60, I could still run 50 yards at a fair speed. And I could run up most any stairs. Now I walk very slowly up the stairs. Not that I got any heart condition, but there are compensations. Seneca, the Roman philosopher, wrote about old age. I don't like the phrase. Frank Lloyd Wright and I are agreed that we have done some of our best work in our 70s, and uh, he has done some of his best work in his 80s. I like the privilege of calling myself old if I like, but uh, I don't like to be called old man. Because for one thing, for one thing, I have a much younger heart for the things that the young love and enjoy over the world than most of the poets now setting forth their obscurantist lines. Long time coming, 
man will yet win. Brother may yet line up with brother. The CBS Radio Workshop, dedicated to man's imagination, the theater of the mind. Today, Carl Sandburg, poet, historian, novelist. The minstrel voice of America, the teller of stories, and the singer of songs. Recorded on his 79th birthday. I've been home early and late, New York, near to the Golden Gate. And it looks like I'm never going to see my wandering. There's a human stir throughout our American song, with the heights and depths to be found in Shakespeare. The rich and the poor, robbers, murderers, hangmen, fathers and wild boys, mothers with a soft word for their babies, workmen on railroad, steamboat, wanderers and lovers at home. They tell what life has been for them. Like every day when I'm at all in hell. and death. Those living men of the past paid that cost. And uh, all the record of American youth in the last war. Better Korea War. But more particularly the World War. Their ethics of valor and endurance and imagination out of our era that. And it's so on so colossal a scale that uh, very hard to get it. But Harry is in now, I think, in proportion to the population, there's many heroes now as there ever were. There is a man. Buddy? Oh, long, long while. To December, and the day goes on when you reach September, and I have lost one day, and I walk a little lane, and I have not time. And the days turn to gold, and the day grew blue. September, no.